everyone. Um, I'm Zoe Little. I'm a campus coordinator with Student for Liberty. And if you've come to any of the webinars from the fall and winter of 2013, you've heard me before. Um, I just wanted to start out by introducing the spring 2014 SFL webinar series that you can see on my screen. Um, we're going to have some really great speakers throughout uh, these first few months of the year. And our first one today is Isaac Morehouse, but I'll introduce him in a moment after I announce one of the most awesome things of the year, um, the International Students for Liberty Conference. It is really soon. It's less than a month away. Um, and registration is still open until February 8th. We have amazing speakers lined up. Um, of course, the taping of the John Stossel Show is a, uh, you, we've done that several years before, and that's really cool. We have awesome keynote speakers, uh, a concert. We have Ethan Nailman from the Drug Policy Alliance. We have Oliver Stone. We have John Allison from the Cato Institute. We've got Jeffrey Tucker, who was on our webinar series uh, last year, a few months ago. Um, we have the Grand Hyatt Hotel uh, reserved for the conference. It's going to be awesome. We have tons of partner organizations. And uh, registration for students is only $35. So that starts on Friday, February 14th, and it goes until Sunday, February 16th, and you really, really don't want to miss it. Uh, register soon, plan your travel soon. It's going to be one of the coolest things you could possibly do this year. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce our special guest tonight, Isaac Morehouse, and our webinar called Changing the Way We Educate. Um, Isaac Morehouse is an entrepreneur, thinker, and communicator dedicated to the relentless pursuit of freedom. He is the founder and CEO of Praxis, an intensive 10-month program combining real-world business experience with the best of online education for those who want more than college. Isaac previously worked at the Institute for Humane Studies and the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, where he created and directed Students for a Free Economy. Isaac has a master's degree in economics with a focus on the Austrian school from the University of Detroit Mercy and a bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy from Western Michigan University, though he feels the latter was a waste of time and money. Without further ado, Isaac Morehouse. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zoe. Um, let me set up so I can show my screen here. Give me just a second. Okay, we should be good. Um, thank you, and thank you, Students for Liberty, for uh, inviting me on. Changing the way we educate. So I'm going to... I'm going to give a spoiler right up front and uh, tell you the conclusion at the, at the beginning. And then you can decide if you want to stick around for the details. Changing the way we educate, that the conclusion is blow the whole thing up, start from scratch, and build it around you. And um, the rest is details. So let, let's get into the details. Um, how do we educate? And, uh, what might be some of the, the problems with the, the current model. So the standard model of education, um, basically education and school are synonymous. Uh, the conflation of school and education is so prevalent, so profound in our society that, um, well, you know, you can do the, uh, do the Google image search test. If you do a Google image search for education um, or even learning, almost all of the images that come up are very institutional, very boring. They're schools, uh, they're rows of desks like the one on this slide. They look like factories. Um, they show pain, people that look stressed. They're going to miss a test or an exam. Um, this, this conflation of education and schooling, and not only are those concepts mixed up, but it brings a whole set of other concepts into the mix. And what's so interesting about that, when I watch my children learn, or when I think about learning myself, actual real learning, it's the complete opposite of any of those images that come up. It's the complete opposite of pain and boredom. Think about things that you've learned, really learned, you know, riding a bike, or playing a musical instrument, or even just understanding a, a concept that you were interested in. Um, you know, your mind was challenged, and there was that breakthrough moment, and it's truly joyous. I mean, I watch my kids as they learn to walk and talk, and as they learn to play video games and do other things. 
So um, it's very interesting that the common, because of the conflation of education with schooling, um, learning has gotten wrapped up in this sort of institutional model and all of its negative uh, association has gone along with it. So there are a lot of problems, I think, with the conflation of education and schooling. And, and that's really the core problem that I'm going to talk about today is this, is this conflation. Um, first, there's a series of false dichotomies that it creates. Um, and, and not entirely false. I mean, these are, these are different concepts that have um, different meanings. But there's very destructive uh, common understandings and very, very stark um, separation between some of these concepts that I think is very problematic. The dichotomy between learning and fun, um, which I mentioned a little bit in just a second ago that, you know, when you think about the real learning you've done, the things you really know, how to drive a car. I mean, that's one of the most fun experiences you have. Maybe it's stressful, but it's also fun. Um, but this, this idea that learning and fun are very separate things, very prevalent, very common belief in our society. Work and education. The idea that, you know, we spend a chunk of our life learning in this thing called education, and then we transition to this thing called work, where we produce things. And, and the, the danger of this dichotomy goes in both directions. One, that when you're getting your education, you can't or shouldn't be working, or that work is somehow a distraction from learning, and that when you're working, you really don't have time to be getting an education or learning because that's a distraction from work. And it's just an absurd idea. I mean, even in our own experience, we know this. We know that every job we've had, we didn't spend hours in a classroom learning how to do the job and then go and just do it. We spent hours on the job learning how to do it. But not just learning how to do the job, learning how to do so many other things and gaining so many other skills that are valuable to us through the process of work. Um, so I think these, this distinction prevents sort of blending of those experiences and creates these, these artificial phases of life. Uh, the theoretical and the practical, another common dichotomy, um, very related to, to that of work and education. You know, humans, we need to theorize and think about the world in an abstract way, but we also need to have sort of tests or ways to put those theories into a context that makes sense, or even things to stimulate theories. It's typically experience and observation that makes you start to draw broader conclusions or ask deeper questions. And I think those are such a, there's such a give and take reciprocal relationship between theory and practice. Um, and yet we have this sort of common under, this accepted understanding that theory is sort of done in books and classrooms. And then practice is something else, and there are some people who are good at one and not the other. What, what's funny is that I've had the, the pleasure of meeting a, a huge number of very successful um, business people and entrepreneurs. And one thing that I find interesting is that almost all of them are incredibly philosophical people. They don't just see what they're doing as you know, producing widgets. They kind of get on a very um, abstract level what it is that they're doing. Um, and I've always found that interesting, that some of the most successful people in the so-called practical world of business are, are theoreticians uh, in a way. They're, they're um, you know, very uh, philosophical in that sense. Um, the dichotomy between what's fun and what's valuable, or what's good for you and what you enjoy. Um, and that was particularly sad, I think, this idea that well, what's good for you is learning your multiplication tables and all these other things that are truly awful and you might hate. Well, some people don't hate them, but you might. And that's what's good for you. But what you really enjoy, what makes you come alive, is maybe, you know, I don't know, dancing or, you know, tinkering on the computer, or playing video games or something, <laughs> playing sports. Um, but that is really not good for you. You really need to be doing more of this thing that's, that's going to be more valuable for your future. And it's such a sad sort of accepted truism where really the whole point in life is to merge what makes you come alive with what's good for you, to continue to explore both of those. How can I get more of what I want, both materially and, and otherwise, um, and do it in a way that doesn't crush my soul? Um, and this dichotomy sort of accepting that this is a fundamental part of life, I think that's, that's part of the school 
on a system does that. You have to do things that you don't enjoy because those are the things that will benefit you in the end. Um, the teacher-student dichotomy, also very interesting um, and, and can be very destructive. I mean, this idea that there's a person that needs to know things and another person who knows things and they simply convey them to the first person, it, you know, it's, it's only that way in the educational setting, this sort of artificial structure. In the real world, there's a person with one set of ideas and a person with another set of ideas. And they overlap. Some people know more about some things and not others. And it's this big, messy mingling of ideas. And they both walk away with, um, you know, uh, hopefully benefit as their ideas sort of merge and they discuss. There's people, everyone is sort of both a student and a teacher at the same time, just like we're both consumers and producers in the world. And I'm sure there's many, many more, but the final one is that between childhood and adulthood. Um, and the more you think about this and the more you observe children, um, the more bizarre this one is as well. The, the current education system has these rigid age-based peer groups that travel together and are all supposed to know the same things at the same phase in life. Um, and it's not based on interest or ability, it's based on age. When you're nine, you're supposed to know X, Y, and Z. If you don't, you're weird, or you go to some sort of class for people who are weird. If you know more than that, maybe that's good, but you might also be a little bit weird. Um, and, and people are really isolated in age groups. And it makes it actually difficult for people to learn how to interact with those of a different age group or to really discover ways in which they excel in certain areas or ways in which they have no interest in other areas that are common among their peer group. A very, I think, destructive dichotomy. Uh, another problem of the conflation of education school is just plain and simple, the, the loss, the financial loss. Because education is so valuable and so important, and because that's widely recognized, the idea is, okay, as many people as possible should have the best education they can. That's great. But since education and school are, have sort of become assumed to be one and the same thing, the idea is, therefore, everyone should have as much school as possible. Access to, you know, free schooling for everyone. As we all know, tan staff hold, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. The schools aren't free. I mean, there's a tremendous cost of the taxes that are paid um, to fund schools, what other uses might those be going to. There's the crowding out effect, the proliferation of, of government provided schools, uh, crowds out a whole variety of other alternatives and things that might emerge uh, in the marketplace for education. There's the dead weight loss and all of the energy and time of, of brilliant, intelligent, um, entrepreneurial people who put that energy rather than producing things of value to others to fighting and finagling and positioning to take control of this school system, to capture it um, and use it to, to benefit one group or the other, fighting over curricula and all these things. Um, and finally, something that I think is tremendously underappreciated in terms of the, the economic cost of the current education model is the lost value both to consumers, uh, consumers, businesses, and young people themselves by those people sitting in classrooms and not actually being out in the world working. And not only are they unable to gain uh, experience, earn money to add value to a business, but also to create value for consumers in the broader economy. The, you know, I can think of a, a lot of 12, 13, 14 year olds who could add a lot of value in a lot of ways to, to many companies. Um, but the education system as well as a lot of the, you know, sort of child labor laws and regulatory regime make that impossible. And what, what's so ironic about this is, you know, we, we have this gut level aversion to the idea of child labor. And I think for good reason. I mean, when you imagine, you know, children chained to some Dickensian factory, you know, churning out widgets or plucking chickens or some horrible thing. It sounds terrible. No one should have to do that. And really they don't. I mean, that, that's, you know, economic progress has, has largely um, made that in places like America not a reality anymore. But what's so odd that we have this aversion to the idea of children being forced into factories, yet the current education system is essentially just that. We force children against their will into these education factories. A buzzer goes off and tells them when they get to eat their food, and then the buzzer goes off and they have to be done. They have to ask permission to go to the bathroom. 
They have no choice with whom they associate, with what ideas are taught to them, with who their teachers are, with what you know activities they do throughout the day. Their entire day is planned from the moment they get up to the moment they go to sleep. They're driven there in these you know crazy looking old school buses and bus back. Everything's long lines. Everyone's uniform. Um, it's it's really bizarre and sort of inhumane when you think about it. Um, so I just throw that out there. If you have an aversion to the idea of, of child labor, um, yet we're forcing kids mostly against their will into these education uh, factories where they don't even get paid and they have no choice and they, they largely can't switch and even try a different one. Okay, I'll try to pick up the pace a little bit here. Um, ideological and educational loss, I think to, to an SFL audience, um, you probably experience this and, and understand this on a um, you know, gut level and, and from experience as well, but just the, the, the curricula that are taught, very politically correct, very watered down, least common denominator stuff, whatever gets through and can appease everybody on the school board and in whatever you know, jurisdiction is what you're going to go with for material. Uh, path dependency, the way that the textbook system is set up, the way that the, you know, the idea is what's considered indispensable knowledge, and what subjects should be taught in what books. You know, Paul Samuelson's horrid economics textbook was being taught for like 50 years, you know, as if there was no new ways to present economics during that whole 50-year period. But it, there's this path dependency um, because of the incentive structure within the, you know, everything from the, the school board and the teachers unions to the textbook companies, et cetera. And there's also, um, you know, there's also problems with the sort of adverse selection. I mean, who who ends up becoming a, a public school teacher? Um, there's some great ones, uh, but there's a lot of so-so and bad ones. And part of the reason, I remember I went to um, Western Michigan University, and it's sort of known as a teacher college. It's one of the main um, degrees that they grant. And it, I mean, inevitably, you run into some sophomore who's like, dude, I'm totally struggling in this communications 101 class. I was going to major in communications, but it's way too hard. I'm switching to elementary education. I mean, that was like the joke, right? Um, so you get sort of a, a strange, you know, you have, it attracts a certain type of person because of the, the union rules and things that make it very hard to be rewarded based on how good of a teacher you are. You tend to be rewarded purely based on how long you've been there. Um, so it attracts a certain type of person that's usually not the type you might want teaching. You know, and obviously the incentives among those who are part of this system is definitely not to teach um, questioning of authority, questioning of the status quo, some of the most valuable critical thinking skills, um, not just if you want people to be exposed to, you know, multiple political ideologies like libertarianism or whatever, but just in general for critical thinking in a system where you're dependent upon the government to provide your job and your income, and we're dependent upon everybody basically going along with that, um, it's not a very good incentive to be teaching, you know, stick it to the man, question authority. Uh, bad tax knowledge, another very, very uh, important problem with the education model. If you think about it, the whole education system is about putting children in a make-believe world um, that's not at all like the world that they will live in for the rest of their career in life. Um, it's very different. It's very artificial. Now, the justification is, well, you know, kids aren't ready to just go out and stick their hand in a fire. You need to set up scenarios that are low risk for them to learn cause and effect so that they will learn later um, when they're in the real world where the cost of making their own choices is much higher. Uh, they will already know that, right? And, and that sounds fine in theory. What's very odd, though, is it teaches cause and effect, but not, not causal relationships that are anything like those they will actually face in the real world. You think about it, you are in a scenario where you're told, memorize these facts by this date, and if you do, you'll get a good grade. So you've got, you know, this is what you have in front of you. If you do it correctly, you'll have a reward, right? So that's teaching cause and effect. But what is the actual causal relationship between memorizing these facts that I have no idea if they're valuable in and of themselves, if they're going to provide me some value in life? I don't know if it's going to matter to me, like, when Ferdinand Magellan lived. But I was told to memorize this, and if I do, I'll get this thing called a good grade. I have no idea what that's supposed to do for my happiness. I guess it will get me into other places where I can get more good grades. It's supposed to get me into a job. I'm not sure. It's a very loose sort of connection. Just do as you're told, and you'll get your sort of artificially created 
um, you know, goodies thrown at you, uh, gold stars when you're little, right? But in the real world, that's not how cause and effect works at all. I mean, if you're in the marketplace and it comes to pleasing consumers, being able to memorize a set of facts or be factually correct about a number of things within a certain time frame may or may not be of any, valuable, any value to anyone. You have to actually learn and figure out what is valuable to people, figure out the, those real causal relationships, even outside of the market. I mean, if you want someone to be your friend or have a, you know, a good friendship or loving relationship with someone, um, you know, the kind of causality that you learn in the school system really doesn't help you. Like, hey, I can do all the things that you tell me to and spit back a series of responses. Like, that's like what a robot does. You, you know, nobody, nobody has a, a great friendship with Siri. Um, what matters for success, understanding how the world works, the, you know, belief that authority should always be obeyed. These are things that, I call them tacit knowledge because you're not, you, you don't, exp no one's explicitly telling you, always obey the rules and that will be your key to success in life. But you come away after 16 years of this kind of educational structure with this built-in belief that, like, obeying rules is always important, even if the rules themselves maybe have never been analyzed for their value and all these other things that I think are dangerous for society and for individual success. And finally, the, the cost of what's not learned through this system. Some of the characteristics that are most important for success are not learned. Entrepreneurship. Real competence, not self-esteem as in sort of the cutesy Disney movie self-esteem movement, which is like, oh, well, self-esteem is important, so we'll put up a bunch of posters saying you can do anything. But that's kind of the opposite of real self-esteem. I mean, real confidence comes from actually doing something, overcoming obstacles, and achieving something. And you say, wow, I achieved something. I overcame obstacles. Just being told over and over that you can overcome obstacles actually kind of has the opposite effect. If you run into any resistance, you sort of feel like I must be a loser or all this stuff that I'm being told is a big sham. The world is a sham. It's all up to fate. Um, so, you know, you're not learning the confidence that comes by trial and error. You're, you're not learning what really matters in life is not going to be listening to teachers and experts. It's going to be listening to friends, loved ones, consumers of your products, right? And you're also not learning that failure is actually really valuable and really awesome and not to be feared at all costs. So um, I think those are some of the problems with the system as we know it. So what's the verdict? Um, you know, I happen to think that this system was never really good. Um, I don't think that the sort of schooling as education uh, approach has ever been particularly valuable. But I think that the cost is far higher now than it used to be. You know, there was a time where the majority of jobs had a relatively low amount of information that you had to process. You sort of had a, a discrete set of uh, instructions or activities to go through, and you went through them. So having years of an education system that sort of just told you go along to get along, obey the rules, uh, it had a cost, but I don't think it was as high. As technology has progressed, and the number of jobs that are basically just, you know, being a, a you know, being a go-between, carrying one box from one place to the next, or, you know, plugging a wire in to connect people on a phone line. Um, those kind of jobs, there's not nearly as many of them needed. That's a great thing. It means more jobs that require creative problem solving and critical thinking are required. And this education system is being revealed for, I think, what it always was, but the, the inferior, um, you know, results that it's producing are much more costly now given changes in the economy. I, I had to put this picture in here of this person at Starbucks because it's just so awesome that someone took this massive monitor into Starbucks to, um, to, to study or whatever they're doing. Um, okay, so, oops, obviously I need to uh, master technology. There we go. Um, so I think there's been this powerful shift in the fundamental unit of value or of importance in society, there are fewer and fewer benefits to being a subset of large uh, groups, whether it be a single church denomination or a university or an employer, uh, and more and more benefits to being an individual with a much more diverse and overlapping set of smaller associations. Um, and I think technology has enabled this. So, so think about some different areas of life and how this has changed. In the work world, 
it used to be that employees, you were essentially attached to the organization or department you worked in. You know, so your identity as a productive member of, of the economy would be, oh, I'm a you know, line worker at GM, or I'm a, a marketing guy at you know, Sears, right? And that's kind of your identity, Sears marketing. Um, increasingly, employees have been empowered to sort of take control of their own brand and to kind of always be on the market. Hey, I'm a guy who can help people see value in products that they might not have seen value in before. Whether Sears wants to hire me to do that, or whether somebody else wants to hire me to do that, or whether I want to start my own firm, those are all possibilities, but this is me, this is my brand. You know, you think about something like LinkedIn, I mean, that's really what it is. It's like a bunch of individual businesses, a bunch of firms out there that are based around the individual. And maybe their paycheck comes from a company, maybe they, they aren't self-employed or have their own business or they're contractors, but really they are their own firm. Um, that's increasingly possible and increasingly necessary. Think about it with health. You know, 50 years ago, you go into the hospital to have a baby or something, and it was so much harder to be knowledgeable on you know, matters concerning your own health. And if the doctor was like, here's what we need to do, X, Y, and Z, take this drug, do this. It's like, yes, okay, you're the expert, just like, do it. Fast forward to today, I mean, even in, even in the nine years since my, my son, almost nine years, was born uh, to my daughter just a couple years ago, the shift in the sort of personalization and individualization of medicine has been amazing to me. We went in with my son, and it was this sort of old school, horrible, paternalistic hospital experience where they're trying to shove all this stuff down your throat. Oh, you need this? You know, yeah, I mean, their thing is just reduce risk you know, at all costs, essentially. And we had, we had done some research and stuff and knew that we didn't want some of this. But, um, you know, it was not a very great experience. And that was really our only option at the time. Fast forward to my daughter, it was like, well, we can get a doula, we can have a midwife, we can go to a birth center. We ended up doing a home birth. Like, I mean, it's so much more tailored to us. And even the hospitals are having to accommodate this and say, you can have midwives in the hospital, we'll work with you on this, that, and the other thing. You can do a water birth if you want. It's so much more based around the individual rather than you live in this county, your hospital is this county's hospital, and therefore your health decisions, you go in and they're like, here's what you need to do, and you say, okay. Um, just de decreasing the barriers to access to information and, and technology has made us sort of the fundamental units that we don't have to rely on these broader institutions. And I think education, it's just the same. It, it's, it's slowly starting to happen, but the potential, the ability for this to happen is there. It's no longer, you know, hey, I went to Duke. That's all you need to know. Duke does the heavy lifting for me. They communicate to you who I am, my value, what I need to be, whether it be an employer or, you know, in you know, your social circles. It's supposed to carry some weight with it. Or even if you're a professor, it's not even the case that you can be like, I'm at this institution, I'm a professor here. The institution sort of frames or the department my identity. I mean, there's fewer and fewer tenure track jobs, so you have to be sort of an educational entrepreneur. I'm a person who's really good at teaching X, Y, and Z. And maybe I do some for private organizations, maybe I do some for this university, an adjunct for this university, maybe I'm doing online courses as well. You're selling your product, and you can't rely anymore on these broader institutions to do the heavy lifting for you. I think this is a wonderful thing. It's about taking control and being deliberate in your explorations, in your learning, in your cultivation for your own personal betterment financially and in every way. So you can't sort of sit back and say, I'm going to just plop myself on the conveyor belt at point A because I'm at the age where that's where I'm supposed to go. And it will move me along. And as long as I don't screw up, I'll come out the end with the right you know, package of tools that I need to go ahead and have a successful career. Um, not really an option, at least if you want to be um, you know, fulfilled and successful. I think it's decreasingly an option, and I think that's a, a, a beautiful thing. So the revolution is here. Um, I think technology and progress and even just changing attitudes, the more we use these technologies, sort of we haven't even realized, I don't think, the implications of things as small as Pandora or iTunes. I really started with, uh, what was it, Napster. Um, you know, you don't buy an album now and just listen to all 10 songs that come on that album. Um, or, you know, buy a whole album because you want one song. Everything is so individually tailored now. It's platforms and modules. And you can pick and choose. And we've gotten so used to that, 
without really thinking about the implications from a more abstract stance, I think that um, that's really powerful. So now we've gotten used to that, now we're demanding that in more and more areas of life. Why should I have to use this garbage service just because I happen to be here? Or why should I have to use whatever taxi happens to drive up? How about I pull out my phone and like pick, you know, and bid out for, <laughs> for people? Um, I think that's a really powerful change. So, you know, with this sort of modular reality, if you want, um, you have more power than ever to discover what it is that you want, what do you want to learn, what do you want your education to be, add value to yourself. Um, you know, you are the product, you are a firm, and it's really your own, increasing your own value, um, and not just financially, I mean in every way um, that education is for, and you, you can take control of that now. Um, this is a giant threat to the status quo, and wherever the status quo is threatened, wherever they are the most afraid and most likely to uh, retaliate, that's where the greatest hope is for liberty and the greatest opportunity. Um, you know, think of the things that scare school lobbies. It's not people running for school board. It's not, you know, you becoming a teacher and being slightly different than the other teachers. It's not trying to elect a new person to office who's going to change core, whatever they call it, you know, core curriculum mandates or whatever. That stuff, yeah, they've got an opinion on it. What really scares them, what they try to shut down and put out of business, is like private school, charter schools, home schools, unschooling. Um, you know, you can see this anywhere. That the cab cartels try to shut down Uber, the government shuts down Silk Road, the FTC and whoever else tries to regulate or shut down things like Bitcoin. It's these alternatives that are so democratic, not in the political sense of democratic, but so individualized that terrify the status quo because these institutions are so used to being in that position where they are the only place you must go through to get certain things, to get higher level learning or to get a signal to employers that you're valuable um, or to get you know the acceptance of being socially normal or basic skills that you need. Um, they were the only place and because they were the only place that, to get those maybe those few things that you wanted. They could throw in all kinds of other crap. They could charge you all kinds of different prices for it. The quality was all over the place. Um, but that's being threatened, and that's scary to them, and it's a great opportunity. Um, so, again, I think you can see this now more than ever, that it's really about what you do to add value to yourself. Your product is just more than the organizations that you affiliate and associate with. And, you know, the, the primary way... To, to add value to yourself, to, to add knowledge and skill um, that's going to make you fulfilled in life, is to do things, is to try a lot of things. And for those who are willing to break out of this educational mold, I think there's huge first mover advantages right now. It's really scary. Um, I mean, I basically unschool my children. There are moments where it's like, oh my gosh, like this is weird, this is sort of scary. You know, what if, I don't know, something horrible happens. Of course, then I just sort of think, compared to what? Like, the bar is pretty low in terms of the standard model. What's the worst that could happen? Um, but I think for those who are willing, there's this there's first mover advantages to really signal, hey, I'm willing to, to break out and try something new. Um, so, the education system, the, the, the conflation of school and education has all these problems. It's been in place for a long time. It's been accepted um, almost without question. Um, it's got a lot of problems, there's a lot of opportunity to change that and take control. Uh, what do we do? How do we make it happen? I think I alluded to this already, innovation is the key to change. It's not going to be electing different people or making tweaks to, to policy. Um, it's going to be creating alternatives. It's going to be um, trying new things and showing how they can work. Uh, it's the proliferation of, of you know, choice on the marketplace. Um, I think that's the key to change. When it comes down to yourself, you know, it's never too late. I mean, most of you on this webinar are probably in college or done with college already. Um, and so you're like, well, I've been through this sort of school factory thing. Um, you know, what do I do now? Well, first, your education is a lifelong endeavor. Um, and the quicker you realize that you've got to continue to educate yourself in, in a way that's tailored to you, uh, the more beneficial. Take the reins. Um, and it really begins with self-discovery and self-honesty. Now, all this sounds so fun and so easy. Oh, cool, I can be my own school. I can, you know, 
do things my own way. I don't have to go along with somebody else's plan. But to be honest, it's actually quite terrifying. It's the most difficult thing in the world. And I think that's the main reason why the current education model has persisted. Yes, there are all kinds of incentives and interest groups that benefit it from it to try to perpetuate it. And there's the prevailing narrative that education means school and everyone has to go or else you're a loser. Um, but I think a big part of the reason it's been able to perpetuate is because most of us deep down are terrified at the thought of being in control of our own education. When you think about it, you know, what do I really like and really care about? First, just discovering that, what makes me come alive, is really hard. It's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of trial and error and a lot of skinned knees. But then once you find it, then it's even harder. Because now what you know what makes you come alive, what if it's something abnormal? What if it's something odd? What if it's something you get mocked for? Now you're accountable to, to actually act on that. And it's terrifying. What if you discover you hate multiplication tables, they're painful for you, and you don't see any way in which you'll possibly benefit from them. Um, you really love playing video games. So you're just not going to learn math. You're going to play video games. You're going to get a lot of judgment and condemnation um, from that kind of choice. to do it and not to be ashamed of it and to say, yeah, this is what I'm, I'm not interested in that stuff. I see no reason why everyone needs to learn this and that thing. I don't think I need to learn it. I'll learn the things I love. That's really hard. It's much easier to say, I'm just going to plop myself on this conveyor belt and as long as I don't screw up, you know, I'll just sort of make it to the next level on, by virtue of my age. Okay, I'm 18. I'm supposed to I have a high school diploma now. It's basically given to me as long as I don't do anything horrible. I'm 22. Now I've got a degree. Now I'm going to a job that takes people with degrees. Um, that's increasingly less possible, which means it's a lot of work on your shoulders. Um, once you take this into your own hands and take control, don't be, be aware, I guess, of preconceived ideas of what it might look like. Because there are a ton of things that are incredibly valuable about the current educational model. Um, you might find that in constructing your own education, you love classroom lectures, and you might find yourself in a lot of them. You might find yourself purchasing items from the you know, schoolroom experience in high school or college, or the whole bundle, if it's a great fit for you. If the engineering program at MIT is exactly what you need to get and it's worth the cost, it very well may be a part of it. So this is not at all like, oh, everything that's being done is terrible. No, by no means. But there's so much out there that's possible and the fact that everyone is treated as uniform widgets and given essentially the same experience with the same knowledge for so many years is, is really quite absurd. So you never know. I mean, your own educational experience might look very similar to the traditional one. It might look totally different. You might never be in a classroom at all. I mean, it really depends on what you want to get and what's going to be best for you. So even if it's too late for you uh, in terms of you know, your, your formal schooling years, so to speak, um, to try something radical, don't forget about the children. If any of you who have children or are going to have children, um, man, unleash them. I mean, let them learn. Let them go out there. There is every incentive in the universe for humans to learn all the things that are going to be valuable to them without us creating silly made-up incentives and, and gold stars. Um, let them get out there. Enjoy this awesome new world. Um, you know, break down the the concepts of what education is, strip it all away and think about what do I want to gain in knowledge and skill and networking and all the things that are supposed to come with the education bundle and ask yourself the best way to obtain each of those for yourself um, rather than just accepting this prepackaged bundle that's given to you. So uh, enjoy it. It's fun. It's disruptive. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions now, and also you can email me anytime if you'd like to talk more um, after, uh, after the webinar. Thanks. Thank you so much, Isaac. That was awesome. Um, I meant to mention this at the beginning, but uh, attendees of the webinar, you'll see a box where you can type in questions on your little uh, GoToWebinar box thing. Um, while those questions come in, uh, yeah, please ask Isaac questions. I will read them to him. Um, we're not going to do the muting and unmuting audio for everyone, but if you'll type in your questions, I will ask them to Isaac. Hopefully his answers will be satisfactory. Um, so Isaac, will you be at the International Students for Liberty Conference? Zoe, I'm glad you asked that. 
Oh. Right, am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Yes, I will be. Um, I'll actually be in a breakout session on, uh, not on education per se, just on uh, how, to, how to be free in an unfree world. So I hope to see all of you uh, there. I look forward to it. That's so cool. Um, I still haven't gotten any questions, guys. Don't you want to ask Isaac some things? Um, he's very interesting. I, I really enjoyed your talk. I feel like... I really enjoyed your talk. Um, if I had said any of those things to any of my English teachers in high school, they probably would have hit me with something large and blunt um, until I stopped talking. Um, oh, here's some questions. Oh, here's some questions. Stop stalling. Um, Beverly Jenkins wants to know, what is unschooling? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm actually, uh, thank you, Beverly, good question. I'm actually fairly new to it myself. Um, there are several variations on it, but it's essentially giving kids as much scope as possible to do whatever they want. I mean, in its most radical form, no curriculum, no schedule. Um, they kind of do what they want with their day. And putting them in an environment where they have access to uh, as much, you know, in terms of resources as possible, so that if their curiosity is piqued by something, they can really pursue it. Um, but that's the idea. There's um, there's unschooling sort of at home. There's also unschooling actually like in sort of a school. Um, if you look up Sudbury Valley School, you'll find a lot of really cool YouTube videos and stuff. And Sudbury Valley was kind of the first um, free school or unschool uh, in the country. It started in the early 60s. Um, and there's several now that, that sort of take on that philosophy. But um, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's very radical um, at first, but the more you start looking into it, the more interesting it is. Awesome. Awesome. Um, um, Andrew Kuzma wants to know, how do you how see you employers, employers that you're capable of the same level of work as a college grad if you have taken an untraditional educational route? Yeah. Um, you know, what's funny is it, it's getting easier and easier because what a degree signals is getting, uh, you know, weaker and weaker. Um, I mean, college is more or less the new high school, unless you're at, like, sort of a very reputable school. If you go to a, you know, generic state school like I went to, it basically signals that, like, you can sort of read and write. <laughs> and that's what's some value to employers, um, definitely. But uh, so the, the signal is weak, for one. Um, two, if you want to signify, I mean, it's really about what is that particular employer looking for. The idea that there's like some catch-all signal that will tell every employer that you're somebody to hire is kind of silly in the first place. I mean, it's, it's such a least common denominator way to think of it. So I think if you can research whatever place you're applying to and look for what would be of value to them and try to find ways to demonstrate that to them, I mean, it might be uh, a lot of quantitative skills. If you can demonstrate that you've passed some sort of, you know, quantitative um, test or something, it might be that they're looking for just a really good work ethic, if you can show your work history. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. I think it forces you to be much more focused and creative. Um, but I think there is this opportunity, especially with the more interesting employers. I mean, if you're going to work for, like, some giant, like, Bank of America or something, all your job postings are going to say you have to have a degree, and if you submit it through some online system and you don't have a degree, you'll probably get kicked out. Um, if you really want that job, there's probably ways to keep hounding them and still be considered even for that. But the more interesting places, the more dynamic companies, big and small, I mean, a lot of the smaller ones, but even places like Google now, um, they're not even looking at degrees. And, and I would say you have the opportunity to stand out above that huge stack of people that just have, you know, 3.4 BA in whatever at generic state university. If you're like, I've taken 100 hours of online courses in this. I've worked or apprenticed here for you know six months doing the following things. Um, you know, here's a website that I built. Um, you know, I, you can even have a narrative around it. I could have gone to college, but that would have been the easy route. I wanted to challenge myself to do something above and beyond because I don't think that was sufficient. Um, there's some real opportunity, I think, to, to demonstrate in creative ways your value. Sorry, that was a bit of a long-winded answer. That's perfectly fine. It was a very good answer. Um, let's see. 
that's another good question. Um, Jared, Jared, I'm going to butcher your last name. Uh, Lucier, Lucier, I don't know. Um, asks, would you agree that there are some fields or professions that might require a more formal, though not necessarily traditional education, for example, like doctors, psychologists, people who are responsible for the lives of others? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree that it's likely. Um, I don't know if it's if you can say with certainty. The, the trouble is it's been so long that these different professions have had cartels that have created legal barriers to entry, um, whether it be lawyers, uh, accountants, doctors, uh, whole, a whole host of professions that have made it you know, illegal to, to operate in that field without a degree or without um, a bunch of you know, hoops to jump through. Um, now, some of those are just private association requirements and things like that, um, and I think there's, those are always going to exist, and for good reason. Like, you want to know that your doctor, you know, someone who knows something about medicine has said, yes, this person knows what they're doing. But we really haven't had a marketplace for that for so long that it's hard for me to answer. I don't know if it was truly freed up and it opened up what the market would look like. I mean, if you didn't have government involved in licensing of the medical profession, I think the diversity, like right now, you're like, oh, well, I have a, some sort of malady. I need to talk to a doctor, as if it's like one thing. You know, there are specialists in certain areas, but there's like doctors, right? And it's like, you know, nurses can't really do certain things, and there's doctors. That, but there's such a huge range among doctors. I mean, some are awful, and some are truly amazing. Um, and it's sometimes hard to, to get that because we have this, as long as they pass this legal hurdle, then they're, they're good enough. Um, so I think it's hard to say what might exist, and there may be people who could be amazing doctors based on you know what they're able to do who didn't spend any time in a classroom, and there may be people who had to spend thousands of hours. I don't know, um, but I definitely think sort of what happens in traditional education, the lecture in front of a class or the more Socratic method or a lot of the things we think of, the research university, those all have a lot of value. Those are all valuable products or services. Um, I just don't think they're universally valuable to the 20 million, 50 million, however many people are going through those. Um, and we really need a market to tell what is and what isn't. Awesome. That, awesome. that would be an interesting feature, for sure. For sure. Okay. It's coming. It's coming. Um, it's coming. Speaking, speaking of speaking things that are coming, um, I've got a question got a from question Andy Braddon uh, asking about um, this this idea of each person being their own individual firm, um, with that in mind, what kinds of business organizations do you see popping up in the future? Oh man, that's a tough. That was one of those tough questions because it's you know pure speculation, and I'm sure 20 years from now, whatever I say will look ridiculous. Um, but I really do think you know more than I guess the legal arrangements themselves. That's sort of details. It's more of a mindset. Um, so, you know, seeing yourself as a unique value creator who can do certain things that are of value to others, um, and always trying to figure out what those are and how you can increase the value, that's the first step, getting in that mindset. Not just sort of like a wage slave who's like, okay, I got in, I'm hired, and now I'm like, you know, protected because I work for some place. But as somebody who's like, I create value by doing the following things. I have a whole myriad of things that I can offer that are valuable to other people. Now, how do I find a way to, to let them know about this um, and to produce things for them and to get the raw materials and all this stuff? That may entail going to work for an existing firm who already has the marketing that can let people know about this thing and who already has access to the raw materials. And you go and say, I will do X for you for you know, Y amount of money. And you could say, well, that's just the same. It's just an employee. But I really think that mindset changes a lot of things. It changes the way that you, uh, sort of the leverage that you have in that situation. It also makes you always looking for opportunity, um, scanning the horizon. Um, but I do think the future, because the transaction costs have gotten so much lower to being an entrepreneur, to being a, a self-employed or to starting your own company. Um, I mean, literally, what I have in my hand here today, this iPhone, this would have been like a million dollars worth of capital. Uh, at 60 years ago. I mean, for real, to do just like a basic business, you would need like, you know, office space with a 
telephone line that could make long distance calls with a scheduler, with a travel agent for every time you want to go somewhere, with it. You don't have to travel to a print shop to make it. You know, I can sit here on my phone, book a flight, schedule five meetings, do a Skype interview, and order some stuff on Vistaprint in like five minutes. I mean, it's truly amazing. So I do see a world where a lot more people are contractors, um, are own their own businesses, because now you can outsource so many functions that you used to, you know, you, you couldn't have your own business because you needed an accounting department, you needed an HR department, an IT department. There are companies and ways to, to contract all that stuff out, to, to be self-employed and to have some firm that does all your accounting for you or that handles all of your legal stuff where you contract when you need this, that, and the other thing. So um, I do see a much more um, individual as firm um, model going forward. The future is so exciting. Um, I have a question from Nick Canham, um, which is a question that I would only receive from a group of libertarians. Um, do you think the current system um, leads to a bunch of people who only respond to autocratic leadership because that's predominantly what we are exposed to in public schooling? I definitely think um, I definitely think that that is a, a factor. I mean, it's it's hard not to to see that if you grow up where parents are, are loving people that are you know involved in their schooling and stuff. But the, the predominant value for all the children, the thing that gets them rewarded by their parents, by their teachers, by society, is shut up, obey the rules, be as similar to those in your age group as possible, um, and you know comply. And questioning whether the rules make sense, whether they're valuable, asking why are we supposed to be doing this? Why am I supposed to be here? Who are you? What do you know that you're supposed to be like imparting all this wisdom on me? That stuff is seen as like terrible, bad attitude, somebody who needs some sort of you know punishment or whatever. Um, and so the people who who make it ahead, and, and there's an interesting argument that um, I honestly now I'm blanking out on who made this argument about why so many academics and intellectuals are, you know, more or less socialist or big government enthusiasts is because the ones who succeed the most, really the educational system, especially when you get into higher education, it's geared towards creating academics. Because the people who make it would get all the best rewards throughout the whole thing, the things that are rewarded are things that teachers find valuable and professors find valuable. So if you make it all the way through you have been the head of your class, you've been winning awards and accolades and been teacher's pet your whole life, and all of those things that you learned how to do and that you got rewarded for, the market might not give two shits about. And your flunky buddy who was with you in high school and like always failed at everything might become a realtor and be really good at selling houses and make a lot more money than you make as like a professor. And now you're bitter. The system must be flawed and unfair. The market must be fundamentally wrong and unfair because I did everything right and I'm supposed to be getting rewarded and what I'm doing is so valuable compared to this flunky person. Um, so I definitely think there's a mentality that, that's bred. I mean, you know, the, the, the causal relationships you observe in that educational world um, are not like those in the real world um, and the things you get rewarded for are basically, you know, following the rules and listening to the teacher. And I think that that doesn't bode well for an independent, uh, critical thinking, freedom-loving society. It's honestly a wonder to me that anybody comes out after 16 years of education <laughs> with, you know, uh, crazy libertarians like you guys uh, emerge. Um, I really think the desire to be free is so strong that even among all that, uh, you can't, can't squelch it. Well, we're very thankful for that, for sure. Oh, I just got a text from a nerdy friend of mine who's listening who said that uh, that was Nozick I was referring to who made that argument about why are intellectuals uh, socialists. So, good, good to have friends. Absolutely. Um, Tim, okay, I'm going to butcher your names again. Uh, Timotheus Stark um, asks, what would be a good way to make education possible for everyone? And how would you create a system with kids as consumers and teachers as producers who want to provide the best teaching that they can. Well, first, Timothy Stark, you need to go out and set up a business called Stark Industries. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, I don't. I, I guess I don't know that there's a best way, but I really think, 
you know, you see this in a lot of areas where even though people are forced to pay for a government system, um, for a long time that's enough to make people say, well, I can't afford to like send my kids to private school or do some other alternative. I don't have enough money and time, and the public school, you know, it's not free, but I've already paid for it regardless, so I, I might as well use it. And you see that with healthcare, but increasingly, those have gotten so bad that people are like, even though government's providing it and I'm forced to pay for it, I'm still going to opt out and at my own expense do something else. And I think the more you see of that, the more you see people saying, oh, my kid's just not going to go to school. He's going to do a bunch of online courses, plus he's going to apprentice somewhere, uh, you know, work with his dad or his mom at a, at a business somewhere, learn some things there, uh, get together with some friends and some other parents and do some sort of co-op maybe take a couple classes at a community college. I mean, these sort of tailored experiences are proliferating, and the market is creating more and more um, you know, responses and saying, oh, there's a market for this. Let's create uh, this and that. I mean, that the homeschooling community is insane, how many resources they have and how many different opportunities compared to even just 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, so I think you'll see this immense diversity, and what that will do there's not one grand scheme or plan or business model that I think is ideal. But it will and already has forced educators to see themselves as firms. I have a service. You know, it's so funny. A lot of teachers and professors get like worried about disruption in the education model, and oh, this is bad. No one will do the valuable things like read Aristotle or come to my class. And I feel like they have such a low view of themselves. They're so insecure. Like you're really good at what you do. If your product you know, it's so bad that you think no one's going to buy it unless they're forced to, then that maybe you should improve your product. But I actually don't think that's the case for most educators. They have something that's valuable. It's valuable to, to learn about a whole host of things, and humans want to, um, whether as a consumption good or as something to, to better them in their career. So I think educators are forced to see themselves more as not able to just latch on to an institution but say, I'm good at X, Y, and Z, and those are things the market values. I also love, you know, I love doing something else as well, but the market doesn't value that as much. I'm going to have to just find a way to do that on my own um, if I can't get paid for it. But there's a demand for research, for teaching, for, for tutoring, for all these things. And I think it's going to it's going to take creative people. There's some cool stuff out there like Skillshare and um, what's the other one, like EPROF or something, where you can go on and teach a class and people can pay to join your class. Um, and you can make like... 500, 1,000 bucks teaching like a one or two night class if you want. If you're really good at it, you could actually make a career out of just doing that. So again, I see this sort of platforms and modules um, reality being a, a really cool way to see a, just a, diverse, a diversity of the way that consumers and producers of education interact with each other. Again, long answer, really vague. It's the best I can do. I don't know the future. <laughs> On the same note, and I suppose you've pretty much already answered this, but uh, Beverly Jenkins asks another question. Uh, if you think that massively online open courses are going to uh, be taking off in the future? I think they'll continue to grow um, and they'll continue to get better. There's probably going to be some online education that like finds a way to be better than any in-person education. There's going to be some things that are just always better in person. Um, but I don't see it slowing down. I see it growing a lot. I see there being a lot of ways to figure out how you can add interactivity to it, um, how you can sort of give a validation or certification of the knowledge you gain so it's not just like, oh, I watched a bunch of videos, but here's some sort of independent certification of the knowledge I gained, the mastery I have of these subjects. Um, yes, I see those pro proliferating. I don't see it as the one thing. You know, now we're going to have basically the university system we have now, except there will be no buildings, we'll all be online, and we'll all be taking online classes. I don't see it going that way. I see it being much more diverse than that, but I think that's a, a huge component um, because you can just access some of the greatest minds ever without having to have a lot of money or to, to live where they, they live. Um, it's, it's really powerful, very powerful and awesome stuff. I've got a great question from Thomas Vogel. Um, it, well, it's, it's not phrased as a question. I'll phrase it exactly as you've written it. Moral arguments will pose the status quo in education to convince your neighbors. Go. Oh, man. I always tend to go to the really, really fundamental level, um, which is this. Kids are humans, too. 
And I think they ought to be treated as humans from a very young age. They're, they're autonomous and, and rational and um, forcing them into a, you know, I'll we'll put it this way. I, I, I once wrote a blog post that described um, someone's dog, someone taking their dog every morning to this, you know, basically described this sort of dog camp every day. And it sounded pretty awful. And every dog owner I know would be like, oh, that's cruel. But then I said, now just replace the dog with a child, and I basically just described the school system. Now, I know that sounds really extreme and horrible, um, but really, I think when you step back and think about it, like, you're forcing your kid to get up at a time when they're, like, not physically wanting to get out of bed. Go, you know, get on a bus with a bunch of kids who are probably half the time being mean to them or whatever else. Go sit in a classroom with someone who may or may not have expertise on topics that may or may not be of any value to your child or even matter in 20 years, and do this every day, all day, for essentially their whole like first 20 years of their life. That seems kind of inhumane to me. Like, what about what does the child want? And, and also, that presumes so much kind of high fatal conceit in terms of what's going to matter. We say, well, it's for their own good. You really presume to know that right now when they're six, learning to read certain things and know what a, you know, the difference between a semicolon and a colon is, is going to be really good for them when they're 40. You presume to know that much about the world, about the future, about their future? I mean, that's, that's a pretty absurd claim in a lot of ways. So. Um, I just think uh, from a moral standpoint, I guess kids are, kids are people too. And uh, step back and watch what they can do if you give them some choice. And if you're not afraid, if they make choices that are out of the norm. That wasn't a quick answer. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure it was sure very, satisfactory very satisfactory to him. Um, you have a lot of faith, Zoe. I'm, I'm presuming too much, I suppose. Um, so last night, this is this is uh, one of the webinar participants has been texting me, um, and he we've been talking about uh, getting the free school of Boone started back up, um, and it, it, there used to be a, a, some community members who would offer classes in various scales and give talks about stuff. Um, do you think that projects like that are a good way of affecting change in the community and uh, sort of spreading the freedom message, um, sort of just getting the community together to share their skills? Yeah, I definitely do. You know, one thing that's cool um, about the sort of entrepreneurial or market-based approach to um, solving social problems versus like a policy or political approach or even, or even an ideological sort of educational approach as in trying to teach people about your belief system, what's cool about it is you don't have to make enemies. I mean, you'll still have some members of the status quo who don't like you, but um, if you say, okay, I'm not here to like convince people to not vote for a certain person, or that schools should get less money, or that public school is a stupid idea, or they need to value freedom above equality or whatever, I'm just here to say, hey, I'm trying to put together this, you know, whatever, gymnastics club. Your kid might really like it. And actually just build alternatives, things that are valuable to people, and now they're experiencing freedom, and now that they've had a taste of it, the government services look less and less necessary and appealing because civil society is doing so much of value. And the minute that someone tries to take that thing away, all of a sudden this person who may be a, not anything like a libertarian becomes a huge advocate for get your hands off of this. I find it valuable. Um, that's what's so cool about that approach. So yeah, I think doing those sort of uh, civil society type things are, are tremendously valuable. I think that's very interesting with, uh, with issues like that. I, I find with, um, my friends who have been homeschooled, it seems to breed this really interesting combination of, of anti-authoritarianism, but at the same time not being necessarily militantly aligned with any sort of political ideology, but just a really strong desire to do something different. I think that's really exciting, and to be able to foster there, that you know, there's, older community members. Well, and there's this assumption that if you're homeschooled or unschooled or you're doing something radically different, sort of individually tailored, that you're going to be like an atomistic person, sort of cut off from the rest of society and community. Um, and it's the total opposite. 
Because when, when artificial community is just forced upon you and you're in it all the time, you don't actually have to go out and do the things that build a true community. But when you choose some alternative, you don't have all these you know, preset things given to you. You're forced for survival to go out and forge bonds and, and forge groups and connections that help each other with this, that, and the other thing and build real community and with a much more diverse array of people from various age groups and everything like that. So um, far from making you isolated, I think it makes you uh, more able to, to build genuine community. Absolutely. I, that's so, so exciting. Everything's so exciting. Um, let's see if I can find a couple more questions and uh, then we'll wrap it up tonight. Um, someone earlier with the go. Um, I guess this has already mostly been answered. But, uh, Mark Lazaro asks, are there any, uh, is there any concern that homeschooling will result in different values um, than the ones that the government necessarily wants? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm sure, you know, the less mass education there is, the more diverse the, the values uh, that people will have. I think that's a great thing. I think sort of in the marketplace of ideas and the marketplace of values and social norms, um, the best ones tend to rise to the top if there's not artificial restrictions and, or mandates. Um, I think that's great. Remember really cool, good stuff, um, and it won't just be least common denominator, you know, mishmash. Um, but those things will have to, to compete for survival in terms of how effective they are at getting people the kind of lives that they want. Um, and I think that's sort of the whole insight of spontaneous order, that people seeking their own ends with their own value systems and things, trying to, to pursue self-interest in, in a world and a market full of other people. Um, Getting along with others is really the most beneficial path. So I think that's a I think that's a great thing. And um, I'm I'm going to try and decipher or not decipher, but add add some more to this question. Uh, I apologize if I get it wrong, Marsha and Wright. But it, it seems to me that Marsha is asking, um, how do you construct a work or how do you construct a educational experience for students? in a non-traditional non way and ensure that it's a meaningful experience. Mm. Um, I don't know that I have a blueprint, but I think first you have to think clearly about what is a meaningful experience and meaningful to whom. So really it's about the, it's about the, the student um, or the, the learner. Um, what's meaningful to them? And, you know, as a, as a parent or as an educator, it is definitely true that you probably have the ability to, to foresee things that you know young people won't and see um, long-term benefits from short-term you know discomforts in ways that they can't. But I think we assume that we have too much of that and that kids have too little. I think they really are a lot better than we think at guiding and directing what is meaningful to them and what is of value to them. And we have this insecurity and fear. I mean, I see it with myself, with my own children all the time. We're out in public, you know, they say and do crazy things, and I'm so embarrassed that I find myself, you know, shaming them or trying to silence them because of my own insecurity. I mean, there's nothing objectively wrong with a kid who does or does not, you know, whatever, believe in Santa Claus at age four or learn to read at a certain age. Um, but we have this insecurity, so I think it's really hard to separate our pressure or, or sense of shame that we won't be seen as normal or cool if our kids don't do a certain thing. And so we call that a meaningful life, but we really have to be careful and think about what's meaningful to them, even if it's weird to us, um, and learn to become comfortable with that. Um, I just want to throw out, because this is related, and it's so powerful, some very interesting studies um, that I've, I've read recently on you know, like kids achieving things at various ages. If a kid learns to read at age four, or age nine, by the time they're 12, there's no difference discernibly um, in their reading ability or any other thing. Um, that's really shocking and really amazing because we tend to be so scared. Oh my gosh, my kid doesn't read yet. They're seven. I'm freaking out. This is awful. Um, 
people are so different and they have such different abilities and capacities. I mean, down to the biological level, down to the way that you know something could taste sweet to one person and, and slightly bitter to the next. I mean, it's truly radical how individual we are. And that goes with our learning styles as well. And I don't think that should be scary or threatening or like, oh, if you don't meet this made up benchmark in the 90th percentile or whatever, you're going to have a bad life. Um, the Sudbury Valley School has all kinds of stories like this. One girl there didn't learn to read. She just wasn't interested until she was 13. And then she taught herself in like a few months. And she went on to win like a Pulitzer Prize when she was in her 30s. Um, so I think we get a little too scared a little too easily as parents and as educators. Um, and assume too much. So really, as much as possible, let the child be the, the guide. Well, that would have been the last question, but I actually did totally mess it up, and the person who, uh, who asked it sent in a sort of clarification. Um, what Marcia was actually asking was about um, practice and how you um, sort of decide on the work experiences for uh, the people who are enrolled in practice and ensuring that those are a meaningful experience for whatever field they're pursuing. Sure, sure. So um, for those of you who don't know, Praxis is an um, educational alternative that I started um, with some others. It's a 10-month it's a program, um, kind of a, an alternative or supplement to college, really. Uh, for young people who have, you know, work ethic and, and skills, um, but who really want to get a lot of the things that college is supposed to provide, you know, the, the knowledge about careers that they're interested in, uh, specific career skills, as well as a lot of the things that come with sort of a liberal arts education, so there's a curriculum component as well. Um, so participants who apply and make it through the application process and get accepted, we then um, go through our, we have a list of, like, over 80 business partners and growing um, businesses that we can place them with. And we try to find one to be a good match for their skills and interests. Um, but most of our business partners are, it's a general enough experience that you're really going to learn sort of all aspects of business to any one of them. So they're not highly specialized. Um, and we don't advertise that you're going to be, you know, learning a really specific skill. It's more about learning the ins and outs of business uh, and entrepreneurship in general. But we try to find a good match, and if participants have geographical restrictions, you know, I can only be in the Midwest or whatever, um, we work within those to the best of our ability to find a good business partner fit for them um, in, in, you know, in, within the geographical area that they're in. So it's really about the experience. It's not about what they're doing or what industry they're in so much as who they're going to be working with, what they're going to be exposed to, and what kind of experience they're going to come away with in terms of an understanding of business and what it takes to, to run a business and be an entrepreneur. Well, that sounds like an awesome program. And I, since I heard about it, I've definitely been very interested in pursuing that myself. And I hope that many other people here are also thinking, oh, that sounds really cool. I want to do that. Absolutely. Check it out. It's discoverpraxis.com. So, and you can email me to any questions. I'm really, really excited about it. It's, it is a very exciting program. And one of the, uh, one of the many variations of the kind of alternatives that I think will continue to emerge. That's so cool that you were able to start that business. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight, Isaac. Thank you, um, all of you attendees, and thank you for your great questions. Uh, you will be able to find this a recording of this webinar um, on SFL website uh, very soon. And uh, until then, I look forward to seeing you at ISFLC, Isaac, and I hope to see uh, a lot of our attendees from tonight. Um, thank you all thank for coming, all for and um, have a great day. Thanks, Zoe, and thanks, everybody. We'll see you uh, hopefully at the conference.